All right, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the OVS VAP Training Center webinar, OVS Case Manager Information. I'm Lee Cush, the Director of Training and Outreach for the Office of Victim Services. And this webinar is a part of a series of webinars offered through our VAP Training Center. Our will be led by Anne-Marie Calabres, the Coordinator for Rehabilitative Services, and Elizabeth Chrysler, one of our Crime Big Specialists One. During the webinar, you'll have a chance to submit questions throughout using the chat function. So we encourage you, as questions come up, to please ask them. Post them in the chat box, we'll monitor them. And then about halfway through the presentation and at the end of the presentation, we'll jump in and answer as many questions as possible. Today's webinar is also being recorded, and materials will be available for download on the OVS website. Uh, in about a week or so, that will happen. But in the meantime, copies of SLA are available via the file transfer function. So as soon as you logged in, you should have seen a chance to be able to download this PowerPoint slides. And we'll post that again at the, towards the end of the webinar. We'll, we'll do the same function share with you uh, so to access that. So yeah, as soon as you exit today's webinar, you will be directed to an evaluation survey on the presentation. Please take a couple minutes and give us your feedback. This is really important, and we appreciate all the content that we were able to collect from that, and it helps us improve future training opportunities. Uh, said, I'd like to formally welcome Anne-Marie and Elizabeth. Good morning. Good morning. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. So the bulk of today's presentation is going to focus on our vocational rehab unit, um, but I'm going to begin briefly with discussing our investigations unit. So please hang tight. So I'd like to begin our webinars and our presentations with just going over the OVS mission statement. It's the mission of OVS to provide compensation to innocent victims of crime in a tight, efficient, and compassionate manner, and direct services to crime victims via a network of community-based programs to advocate for the rights and benefits of all innocent crime victims. So before Anne-Marie does her discussion on the VOC Rehab Unit, I'm just going to briefly discuss how a victim does become eligible with our office for services. So the thing a victim must do is to complete an application with our office. Once application is received, an investigator will then determine if the victim meets the eligibility requirement, requirements as defined by OVS statute. The victim must then also incur a compensable out-of-pocket loss, or have the potential to incur one in the future. Technical difficulties. So all crime victims may be eligible with OVS, um, so it's important to remember that an investigator will determine if a victim is eligible for compensation. So now we're just going to briefly overview who might be eligible for OVS compensation. It's victims who sustain physical injury due to the crime. If the victim was not injured due to the crime but did sustain a loss of their damages um, to articles of essential personal property, they are a minor under 18, elderly over 60, or legally disabled, they may still be eligible with OVS. It's for the surviving spouse, parent, parent, step parent, child, stepchild, guardian, siblings, step siblings, or person dependent upon a victim who dies as a direct result of a crime. Anyone who has paid or incurred the funeral or burial expenses of an innocent victim who did it as a direct result of a crime. And minor victims are also eligible with OVS, as well as minor witnesses to a physical injury crime. However, it is important to remember that whenever we have a minor victim, they're not able to file a claim on their own behalf. We do require a a legal BN, the biological parent, or the power of attorney to follow a claim on behalf of a minor or any incompetent dependents. If this has not sustained a physical injury due to the crime, 
they may be eligible for OVS compensation based on the criminal charges listed on the police report. Um, we do have a full list on our website of these charges, but this is just a few examples. Victims of unlawful imprisonment in the first degree, kidnapping in the first or second degree, certain stalking offenses, as well as human trafficking victims. Um, this includes trafficking and sex trafficking for crimes committed on or after November 1, 2007. So earlier, not all crime victims may be eligible for OVS compensation. An investigator will determine that. We look at several components surrounding both the victim and the crime itself. We look at the victim, and the first thing that we're going to do is ensure that the victim is considered by police to be an innocent crime victim. Um, essentially, we will confer with law enforcement and the district attorney's office to determine if the victim was also committing a crime when it happened. Um, so we do take into consideration things as if the victim had a weapon on them when the crime was committed, if there were any cross complaints, if the victim was also arrested. We do require victims to be cooperative with both law enforcement and district attorney. We look at if the victim was physically injured due to the crime, as well as the victim's age and disability status. And then we'll also look at the components surrounding the crime itself. We do require the crime to be reported to the police within seven days of the crime occurring. And we do require that the claim be filed with OVS within one year of the crime occurring. How there are certain um, <clears throat> cases where this might not occur. Um, for example, if we have child victims, they might not disclose the crime for many years or if the victim is fearful of the perpetrator, is fearful of retaliation, they might not report the crime to the police within some days, or they might get that application into OVS within, within one year. So we do ask that the victim explain those circumstances when they submit our application. And for our domestic violence victims not um, able to report the crime to the police, we do ask that they submit copies of their signed family offense petition and the signed order of protection in lieu of a police report. So at this point, we're going to just briefly mention what OVS can um, provide to victims and our compensation. So we pay up to $500 for the repair or replacement of essential personal property that was lost, damaged, or destroyed due to the crime. This includes a maximum of $100 is what we gave for any cash that was stolen due to the crime. We also cover medical or counseling expenses that aren't covered by any other source, optional rehabilitation for older. expenses. For victims who miss time from work due to the crime, due to their crime-related injuries, we can pay lost wages. We can pay for funeral and burial expenses up to $6,000. If a victim was forced to flee to a domestic violence shelter due to the crime, we can also help with those expenses. If a victim has been subpoenaed to appear in court or testify for any reason by the DA's office, we can also provide court transportation. On physical injury and death claims, we can pay for crime scene cleanup. And we can also pay for moving and storage expenses. This is common in our domestic violence cases, stalking cases where the victim might need to move to a new location, to a safe address. Um, so we can do a maximum of 2500 for both moving and storage. Once an investigator obtains all of the documentation and the information that they need, they will then render a decision on the claim. The claim will either be awarded or denied. So before we move on to the voc rehab section of this webinar, we're just going to close out the investigation investigations portion with a statistic, annually OVS renders approximately 15,000 original decisions, which includes awards and denials made by the, o the Office of Victim Services, Older. plan reinvestigated or reopened as necessary. I'll take a couple moments to answer any questions you might have about this portion of the 
the presentation. Just give us a couple minutes to go home, but please feel free to keep adding content uh, in the or questions in the chat box. Questions, just one regarding uh, the slides available afterwards. And yes, uh, as we stated earlier, we'll be happy to share all of the slides, both on our website um, once the webinar has been recorded and published, as well as at the end of today's presentation, we'll do a file transfer right on your screen where you can get a copy of it and be downloaded. There are a couple other questions that are a little more specific that we'd be happy to answer, and we'll actually re reach out to a few of you privately um, to answer those as well. Meantime, we're going to turn it over to Anne Marie. Welcome, everybody. I'm really looking forward to working with all of you. Um, we have yep. we started with the victim assistance program, and this you guys are are so well familiar with. So agencies and organizations provide assistance such as counseling and crisis intervention, advocacy and legal help to those in times of need. Professionals who work for victim service providers can access documents, advisory bulletins, informational emails, and other information. Yeah. Results of um, the case management position, we've um, come up with a uh, VAP authorization update form, and this will be available Hold to you folks. When needed, um, it it is uh, something that we will use if we refer to you, um, and that would be myself and Lisa Lohan works in the vocal rehab unit as well. Um, it's it's pretty self-explanatory, uh, just to share the information and to make sure the claimant is aware uh, if we're making a referral. They also reach out to your programs and refer themselves. Because of good work that you did, they have uh, a claim and a claim number, and um, their applications have been forwarded. They've been awarded, and as a result of that, um, they can come to the additional med unit. Uh, as a, perhaps a personal injury, so they need some assistance. Um, we can we can determine if uh, this assistance is medically necessary related to the crime, and as a result of that, we would need a physician script or document on data that is necessary for, for their care. And if the patient has insurance, the insurance will be billed. Um, if not, uh, we'll see uh, an explanation of benefit, which is called an EOB, and that will tell us whether uh, the insurance will cover this medical need or it will be the total patient responsibility, and that's when OVS will fit the claimant. Uh, OVS can uh, reimburse for medical and other related services not covered by insurance or the benefit programs, uh, neuromuscular retraining, cognitive behavior therapy. Also reimburse for supplies covered by insurance, but um, they have limited supplies. Affordable non-sterile and sterile gloves, Q-tips, dressing supplies, incontinence supplies. And we can also reimburse for additional rehab services when have reached their maximum, um, as in PT, OT, speech therapy. We also can assist uh, with 
outside uh, agencies, are, um, additional team management sources. Uh, as as a, an example, it would be chiropractic, massage therapy, and acupuncture. Um, a lot of folks that are injured have quite a uh, bit of pain, and it takes a while for them to uh, get back to their uh, status before the injury, so we can assist with that. We are reimbursed for home care needs. Um, we provide home health aids, private uh, personal care aids, and nursing services. These also would require um, medical documentation, and uh, it needs to be established that uh, the need of these extra uh, services uh, is related to the crime, um, that that would be established. Uh, we uh, will coordinate with other agencies and um, private hire uh, claimants are able to choose their providers as long as they're certified. Okay. Um, let's see. We can do um, and reimburse for medical transportation. Um, we find this is a huge um, a shot on people uh, to get back and forth to uh, their therapy appointments and doctor's appointments and using um, public transportation uh, becomes a problem, especially if they're in a wheelchair. Uh, so at we do recommend that claimants use the access transportation if available, but we'd like them to um, we them to uh, try first, and if not, then we will help with um, this. Okay, we like them to we can help them with um, transportation if that is an issue. Um, I know I've heard stories of people going to their physical therapy appointments and they're late and then they don't get to have the therapy that um, is required. So that is a, a, a benefit and it is a huge need for people. We also can uh, provide ambulance and ambulance transport, especially for people in wheelchairs. They need to be locked down when they um, travel, so this transportation is, a, is obviously a safe way to, to go. Um, we also can help out with medications not covered by insurances. And um, examples of that would be contra contra bowel regimes and some over-the-counter um, medication and, and supplies. Digital equipment uh, that we provide uh, is and, um, needs to be medically necessary and related to the crime. We um, encourage people to get custom wheelchairs so that the wheelchair will fit these in their bodies. A wheel can provide standards and rolling shower chairs, which is a help um, with people when they need to, to use the bathroom facilities. We also um, provide extra accessories with the wheelchair. Uh, to, that these helps, this helps with the specific needs and it enhances the functioning of each person. We have somebody, um, a, a, a client, and um, they will how how are they they identified? How does this whole system work? So a client can request on the application, as you are aware of, uh, they can request voc rehab, or the investigator, because of the amount of um, needs, can can they uh, refer to us, or the med specialist can refer to the voc rehab unit and and uh, identify someone who would need extra uh, rehabilitative support and extra medical need hair. And as a result of that, we uh, send out a voc rehab letter. Slide is, is an example of this, where it kind of outlines what exactly we can do, as the, the former slides um, have referred to, about home care services, additional occupational rehab, what we have about with the medical rehab, and we do uh, refer quite often to Access VR, which was formerly vested, um, that helps 
our victims with uh, retraining if they want to go back to work or access the community. Uh, SSVR helps uh, folks get uh, going, they do some testing, and they uh, help refer to community agencies that can assist with their, uh, the person's um, needs. So the vocational rehab services, um, a rehab candidate would look like someone who is um, paralyzed, has traumatic brain injury, a loss of limb, low eyesight, hearing, crime-related PTSD. Um, a lot of times someone uh, walks out of the house and they're walking, and as a result of a, of an, a, a crime, they become paralyzed. Their world totally changes. And um, we are to help assist them get back uh, functioning as best we can. Uh, OFT can provide, uh, again, the durable medical equipment required. Um, with folks with traumatic brain injury, we work uh, very closely with the Traumatic Brain Wizard Program and supply um, cognitive rehab for our claimants. And all the loss of limb, eyesight, hearing, we, we assist with uh, any kind of um, adaptive equipment. Uh, lo uh, the low eyesight, uh, uh, low eyesight glasses, uh, hearing or speech. Uh, there are some um, uh, equipment, some equipment out there that can uh, assist people to to enhance um, with their their disabilities. And then related uh, PTSD, uh, that can encompass counseling um, and, and uh, various aspects of, uh, of that. Um, we also uh, help out with the vehicle modification and driver training. Um, if someone was injured and say they just injured uh, an arm, but that would affect their driving, we could. Uh, reimburse for the training that would need to occur to help them adapt, and we would help uh, modify the vehicle per the training uh, regulation. Modifications, as anybody in a wheelchair um, can testify, to just to get in and out is, uh, is a huge accomplishment. So we do uh, work with uh, getting ramps um, and bathrooms that accommodate uh, People being able to go to the bathroom and to shower effectively, um, widening doorways, and um, what you know comes up in the in the li living of their homes. And again, we do coordinate with Access VR for training and re-education, and we do have the uh, assistive technology devices that um, become quite cutting edge in this day and in the age. And um, several are are connected to computers. Um, and there are um, apps that uh, we can get, so we do work uh, closely with uh, the Association of the Blind and uh, Hearing Impaired. So we had uh, some really great questions come in, so give us two minutes and what we're going to do is start to sort and organize and get to as many as we can. Um, so hang tight for just a second, and in the meantime, if you still have more questions, please use the chat function box and we'll uh, try to get to them as much as possible. Meantime, too, if we don't get to everyone's question, what we'll do is a formal Q and response as well for the ones that we can't answer. So that will get published um, online along with the slides and everything as well. So hang tight for just a second.
Okay, so we're going to go through some of your questions right now and to as many as we can. Yeah. Someone asked, do we need receipts in order to be compensated for essential personal property? And this is yes. So about a year ago, there was a change in our legislation. So we do now require receipts for an essential personal property. This can be an original receipt, um, or it can also be a replacement receipt. If the victim goes out and replaces the item, they can then just send us that receipt. Um, our exceptions, and this is for our domestic violence victims who have to flee due to the crime, and then arson victims as well. They would not need to submit the receipt. And then we also received a question about the moving cost and whether that would include any um, type of rent assistance and like first and last month's rent. So I do want to clarify, we don't pay any type of rent assistance. We cannot help a victim um, find a new residence. What we can do is we can move the victim from point A to point B. We can move them and their belongings, but we actually put down um, a security deposit. We can't pay any type of rent assistance. If we we'll spend money out of pocket for supplies, can we submit receipts for those items like bandages, etc.? Yes, absolutely. We need to have the receipts, and it would have to be obviously um, supplies that um, are medically necessary and related to the crime. Um, and also, with the former questions uh, about rent, um, if people have out-of-pocket expenses, they have um, financial uh, hardships, one of the reasons why we saw the need for case management was for your folks to help us with what VS can't do. We, we can only do so much in the scope of the statute, but as a result of somebody being um, victim of a crime and do need to get help, Housing. They were in the hospital for two months and they lost their apartment. That would be a function that we would see you folks trying to help uh, assist the victim with. Because we, you know, from where we sit, um, we don't know what's available to them in the community. I know housing is an issue, but that would be a resource that we would use you folks for for any of their um, daily needs. Okay, there's also a question about. Uh, uh, I have a question regarding vehicle and home modifications. The client has to pay, then possibly reimbursed by OVS when the OVS application is submitted. Um, you know that uh, that 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 does occur. Um, it does work uh, best if we are aware of it, um, because sometimes we wouldn't. If everything, if all the criteria isn't met, we wouldn't want somebody to think that they were going to be reimbursed if they couldn't. So know that somebody, um, for example, is looking for a car that has to be more modified. We have specific guidelines for these, uh, the cars that can be modified. So it's best to um, work with us or get information um, for than to, um, you know, pay for something and then possibly not, not be able to be reimbursed for, for it. Well, the referral, yes, I, I went over that. The referral would be um, basically a direct call from myself or Lisa um, and a chat about a particular claim. Um, we would probably get everything signed and ready to go. Um, I see it happening in different ways, and it's kind of be work in progress. Obviously, the claimant can um, go to you folks and, and say that they need specific help for this or that. Um, what happens is that in a lot of cases, especially with people that are paralyzed or they're, they're just their lives have changed, um, we know that there have been some some lackings of what OVS can do. And again, we do it everything that we can, but there are some things that we can't do, and um, that would be when we would identify these uh, social services, food, housing, uh, and and that to see what available to these women in, in, in the particular community that they live. That would be how we would get a referral to you folks. Okay. 
is transportation reimbursable by paying for mileage? So if one of the claimants had to get to an appointment and they felt that, you know, they didn't want to use public transportation or couldn't, yes, uh, we, we do pay the federal guidelines for mileage. Um, they, the person would have to have a receipt from going to, like, say, their physical therapist or their doctor, and then we would uh, reimburse for the mileage to from those appointments. I'm seeing a question about if there are any documents that are acceptable instead of a police report. Um, so, yes, we can accept certain documents um, in lieu of a police report. However, if the crime was reported to the police, we have to have the police report no matter what. But, for example, if we have a sexual assault victim who did not report the <clears throat> crime to the police, we can accept the um, FRE instead. If we have a domestic violence victim who did not report the crime to the police, in lieu of that, we could accept the signed family offense petition as well as the signed order of protection. Um, and for human trafficking victims, um, there's going to be the letter including their human trafficking number, and we can accept that in lieu of a police report as well. Oh, this was getting a service animal certified. This in that we um, are looking at, but it's not happened. So we do not pay for um, service animals, therapy animals. Um, we're not at that point yet. Uh, so uh, that's something that we, we have entertained, but it is not something that we can reimburse for at this time. Does this include copay for any medical? So this is back to somebody who paid out of pocket for bandages or um, extra uh, uh, medical supplies. And then, does this include copays for any of the medical expenses occurred? Yes, um, it can include the copays, but again, with that, we would need an itemized bill and the EOB, which is short for explanation of benefits, and that would tell us directly what the uh, the claimant's copay is. I cannot afford, afford to allow the money for a DME. So, say a person has no insurance. Um, in some cases, that makes it easier for us because we don't have to worry about uh, the EOB. So, if someone has no insurance and they need a new wheelchair, uh, we need to get a doctor's note. Uh, we need to be able to establish that the wheelchair is because of a crime, and then we would work with uh, the, the claimant and um, the rehab person, they will measure the person and um, suggest different uh, wheelchairs, and they'll work together with the claimant to, to uh, get a chair that will work for the claimant and, and their needs. So they would not have to lay out any money for the wheelchair. Just reading these uh, questions. I did see another question about pet birding, if the victim needs to move, and that's um, unfortunately something that we cannot cover. We don't have anything related to pets at this time. How quick will clients get compensated? So AdMed is a, a unit that we work with, and they're constantly working on the bills that come in. Um, and I think they do a very good job for the volume that they have. If I'm working directly with someone and I get a bill, I usually take care of it within a day or two. Um, as a result of that, it goes to the comptroller's office. They cut a check and um, they're reimbursed. So the turnover time is, is pretty um, pretty good. Um, so with people, if they pay out of pocket and they use a credit card, if they get the bill to us right away, we try to get the uh, payment out to them so it's within the credit card cycle. But don't quote me on on that. I mean, we, we do try the best we can, but, but sometimes things uh, get glitched up. So we have a question about, does the police report need to specifically state the items were damaged or destroyed to receive compensation? So generally, if a victim is requesting clothing, we can assume that the clothing was, you know, damaged, bloody due to the crime. Um, Typically, we do require the police report to list any items that were damaged. 
um, but sometimes they're just not listed on the police report. We have what we call the Essential Personal Property Verification Form. We will send out to the victim, and basically they will just state what items were damaged due to the crime, how many of that item, and they will just sign off and verify to us that the item was actually damaged due to the crime. So we can use that in lieu of it being specifically stated on the police report. I did see um, a question about the emergency award uh, process. That's not something we discussed in this webinar, but basically what OBS can do is we can pay a maximum of $2,500 for certain services. Um, what will happen is the advocate, such as yourself or the victim, will have to contact our office and let us know if they're requesting an emergency award. This is our office would pay for a service up front. Um, typically, this is for funerals, um, HIV, and other medications, um, moving and storage. So we actually pay the provider up front. The victim wouldn't need to um, pay anything out of pocket. So we do have a process. Um, we have certain requirements. So if you do have any questions about that, um, you can always contact us. But so it is something that's out there. Um, it typically takes about one to three days. We do try to get it done um, within one business day, but it is always an option for victims who might not be able to pay anything out of pocket um, up front. So and to reiterate, um, it's great that uh, I think this was a good review for all of us as to what OVS can pay for in the process. And the case management position is um, new. We're, we're going to be forging a new as we go, um, but again, I see you folks as people that are like our eyes and ears in the community, again, helping us um, to, to do things that, that Office of Victim Services can't do under our statute. And, uh, you know, again, uh, food, uh, clothing, shelter, things that are available to, to folks in the community that you're aware of is what will be um, a, a great assistance. On state, I know there, there, are, there are unique needs, and then now, um, too, in Western New York, upstate New York, and in North Country, um, we try to help our people. They have so many less services available to them. We have a claimant that came to my attention that uh, was a brain injury, and he uh, was afraid to go out of his house, and we're calling our agency all the time. We try to set up transportation, and because of it, he just was paranoid. Um, and we didn't get, get or take guys. We, we tried to contact the clinic, and the clinic reached out to him. Um, public health. But in a case like this, I would see a case manager as going to this person and um, seeing him once a week and trying to establish a relationship. So it, it, your, uh, your skills and your services um, will be very diversified, and I see us as working together um, on each claimant. Um, I'm, I'm hoping to establish some sort of a protocol um, as to how we're going to communicate, um, and they, those uh, means will, will probably vary too as to what we're um, hoping that can be done with our claimants. Um, I'd like to see if maybe as we get going, we have two conferences, um, and if you guys have any suggestions as to how to manage um, people with these needs, uh, I'd be more than willing to work with you. And, uh, you know, keep the lines of communication open and have this uh, this position be something that's really quite helpful to um, our, our claimants that have such high needs. Ready, everyone. There were also a couple questions about sharing slides and 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 specifically about the um, or the questions that were submitted. If we will get to the ones that we didn't and share those, and the answer is yes, we will. So we. Hope to, in this week or so, have the recorded webinar live as well as all the slides formal response to the questions posted on our website. If you attended today's webinar and signed up with your email address, what we'll do is once they are live, we will email everyone directly a link to all of that information. Um, I want to uh, offer a special thank you to Elizabeth and uh, Anne-Marie for today's, putting together today's webinar. Don't forget to take a few minutes to complete your webinar evaluation. As soon as you exit today's webinar, you'll actually be redirected to a SurveyMonkey um, survey. Please take a couple moments to do that. And again, everyone, thank you so much for participating today. 
if you have any last minute questions in, in the next minute or so, we'll leave the chat function open and, and do our best to also answer those um, and, and publish them in the next week or so. So thank you for attending today. We appreciate you joining us and have a great day.